Shalom, shalom. First and foremost, I want to give all praise, honor, and glory to Yahweh, Bahasham, Yahweh Shai, Bahasham, Racha Kodash. Double honors to the Apostle Elders of Great Millstone. Peace and blessings to the hopeful elect. In this lesson, I want to do a response video to what the Elder Aram Lub did. Uh, I believe this was about Monday that this lesson he came out and did. Uh, the, uh, as you can see, the title of the video is Proselytes, Esther chapter 8, verse 17. And I'm going to believe, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that uh, vocab and certain other individuals who are of the Christian church are trying to use Esther 8 and 17, which was happening during uh, the time of Esther, how the Heavenly Father delivered us out of the hand of Haman. That, oh, when it says in the letter there uh, by uh, King, um, King Xerxes, if I'm not mistaken, that, oh, you know, all the people wanted to be, you know, uh, want to be Jews and things like that. And you're going to hear him break it down, explain it. But there is something that he mentions in this video about the book of Josephus. And I remember when he uh, when he said that, that sparked me to go uh, do this lesson because I know exactly what he's talking about. And I have it highlighted in my uh, Josephus book. So I just want to bring out that edification that he is uh, talking about. So I'm going to play the video, let you hear what he says, and I'm going to bring out the... Uh, that part that he mentions about in the book of Josephus, just to back up the elder apostle. Was in that conspiracy, but it mainly speak, main, mainly mentions him and his sons. And many of the people of the land became Jews. Why? For the fear of the Jews fell upon him. So it, they weren't convinced. Oh, you know what? I like their Jewish religion, so I, I'm going to just, you know, become a Jew because, you know, I, they got such a nice... No, they were scared. So they were trying to hide behind that. When you go, when, there's a um, <clears throat> there's a passage in um, in the Josephus where it speaks about the Samaritans, which were heathens, you know, because the heathens were uh, transplanted into the land of Israel, into the land of Samaria. So whenever there was good done unto the Israelites, they would say, yeah, we're Israelites too. But then whenever there was evil decreed upon them, they told the truth. No, we're not Israelites. You know, we're these nations that we were brought here by the king of Assyria and blah. That's when the truth would come out. So these people of these lands, they, they called themselves Jews because they were scared. Right. And I have that passage right here in the book of Josephus. Now, this is going to be somewhat of a long reading, but I am going to skip certain parts just to give you the full, at least the, you know, the most important parts. But it will be somewhat of a long read. Now, just to give you a synopsis of what's going on, this is during the time when Alexander the Great was coming into power. Now, also, I'll even tell you the chapter. It is chapter 8, and I'll read the subtitle for you, just so you know. So it says, chapter 8, and it says, concerning Sanballat and Manasseh and the temple which they built on Mount Gerizim, as also how Alexander made his entry into the city Jerusalem and what benefits he bestowed on the Jews, which the Jews are Israelites, right? So I'm going to get that. So like I said, I'm not going to read the entire thing, but I'm going to get like the main important parts. But just to back up what the elder apostle was saying, that is true, right? So right here it says, but Sanballat, though he had now gotten a proper opportunity to make his attempt, so he renounced Darius, right? Which Darius would be the uh, king of the Persians, if I'm not mistaken, Darius the third, if I'm not mistaken, right? But again, like I was saying, this is when Alexander was coming up into power, right? The king of the Greeks. And taking with him 7,000 of his own subjects, he came to Alexander, which is Alexander the Great, and finding him, I'm sorry, and finding him beginning the siege of Tyre, he said to him that he delivered up to him these men who came out of out of places under his dominion and did gladly accept of him for their Lord instead of uh, Darius. So when Alexander had received him kindly, Sanballat there, thereupon took courage and spake to him about his present affair. He told him that he had a son-in-law, Manasseh, who was brother to the high priest which I'm going to guess this is probably Judah, but it says Jad Jadua. I'm not sure if that's Judah or not. I'm guessing it might be Judah. But continuing, says, and that there were many other of his own nation now with him that were desirous to have a temple in the place places subject to him, that it would be for the king's advantage 
to have the strength of the Jews, which the Jews are Israelites, right? Divided into two parts, lest when the nation is of one mind and united upon any attempt for innovation, it proved to be troublesome to kings as it had formerly proved to the kings of Assyria. Whereupon Alexander gave Sanballat leave to do so, who used the utmost diligence and built utmost diligence, excuse me, and built the temple, and made Manasseh the priest, and deemed it a great reward that his daughter's children should have that dignity. Right, so let's fast forward a little bit. Oh, okay, actually no, it's not too far away. But when the seven months of the siege of Tyre were over, and the two and the two months of the siege of Gaza, Sanballat died. Now Alexander, when he had taken Gaza, made haste to go up to Jerusalem. And Jadua, the high priest, when he, when he heard that, was in agony and under terror, as not knowing how, uh, how he should meet the Macedonians, since the king was displeased at his foregoing disobedience. He therefore ordained that the people should make supplication and should join with him in offering sacrifices to the Heavenly Father, right? So they're besieging the Heavenly Father for help, right? Unlike today where our people are going all crazy over Trump being back in office, but you should besiege, you should be besieging the power of the Lord, not the power of man, right? As the scriptures say, cursed is he that trusts in man and make it arm his flesh or arm his strength in so many ways, so many words, excuse me. All right, so offering sacrifice to the Heavenly Father, whom he besought to protect that nation and to deliver them from the perils that were coming upon them, whereupon the Heavenly Father warned him in a dream, which came upon him after he had offered sacrifices, that he should take courage and adorn the city and open the gates, that the rest appear in white garments, but that he and the priests should meet the king, which is Alexander, <laughs> Uh, but that he and the priest should meet the king in the habits proper to their order without dread of any ill con consequences, which the provider, uh, 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 which I'm sorry, which the providence of the heavenly father would prevent. Upon which, when he, when he rose from his sleep, he greatly rejoiced and declared to all Uh, the warning that he had received from the Heavenly Father according to which dream he acted entirely and waited for the coming of the king. Mm, yeah, we're still going to read all this. Yeah, It's so like I said, this is a long reading, but this is to back up the elder apostle and hopefully this is edifying. So continuing, it says, and when he understood that he was not far from the city, he went out in procession with the priests and the multitude of the citizens. The procession was venerable and the manner of it different from that of other nations. It, it reached to a place called Sapa, which name translated into Greek signifies a prospect. For you have thence a prospect both of Jerusalem and, the temp and of the temple. And when the Phoenicians and the Chaldeans that follow him thought that they should have liberty to plunder the city and torment the high priest to death, which the king's displeasure fairly promised them, the very reversed of it happened. So here it is, just to give you a short synopsis. The high priest knows that Alexander's coming, thinking that, oh, he's going to destroy our city. What should we do? Besiege the Lord, pray to the Lord, offer sacrifice to, sacrifice to the Heavenly Father. And what? The Heavenly Father gave him a dream and told him, look, dress the, you and yourself and the priest in white, in white and, you know, you know, come out peaceably to him. But here it is, Alexander's cohorts, people that were with him, right, excuse me, want to besiege the city, take down our people, right? Yes, I know that may sound strange to some people, but yes, take down our people. Again, you so-called blacks, Latinos, and Native American Indians, this is your history right here. Now, no Spanish history, now no black history month and all that, no. This Bible, these, this, uh, the Bible, the scriptures, this is your history, right? So yes, when Alexander and his cohorts or at least the cohorts of Alexander want to come and besiege the city, the spirit of Alexander was changed because the Heavenly Father changed his mind. As the scriptures say, the king's heart is in, is in the hand of the Lord, and whithersoever the Lord turneth it, whithersoever he like. So Alexander may have had his intentions to do something, but what? The Heavenly Father changed his mind to be peaceful unto them, and we're going to see as to why. 
So continuing, where was I? Right here. It says, For Alexander, when he saw the multitude at a distance in white garments, while the priest stood clothed with fine linen, and the high priest in purple and scarlet clothing, with, with his mitri on his head, having the golden plate on which the name of the Heavenly Father was engraved, he approached by himself and adorned that name and first saluted the high priest. The Jews, which are Israelites, also did all together. With one voice saluted Alexander and encompassed, and encompassed him about, whereupon the kings of Syria and the rest were surprised at what Alexander had done and supposed him disordered in his mind. So they're like, hold up. We thought homie was about to take this out, give out the order. But he seemed like he, he cool with them. Like, what's going on here? Right? However, Parmenio alone went up to him and asked how it came to pass that when all others adorned him, he should adorn the high priest of the Jews. To whom he replied, I did not adorn him, but that the heavenly father who had honored him with that high priest. For I saw this very person in a dream. So Alexander is giving you the account of his dream, right? This is why the Heavenly Father gave the high priest that order, right? What to do? Because this dream was given to Alexander, what he was going to see when he came to the Israelites, right? So let me go back there. Uh, this is Alexander's response. To whom he replied, I did not adorn him, but that God who had, who had honored him with that high priesthood. For I saw this very person in a dream, in this very habit, when I was at Dios in Macedonia, who, when I was considering with myself how I might obtain the dominion of Asia, exhorted me to make no delay, but boldly to pass over the sea thither, for that he would conduct my army and would give me the dominion over the Persians. Whence it is that having seen no other in that habit, and now seeing this person in it and remembering that vision and the exhortation which I had in my dream, I believe that this, I'm sorry, I believe that I bring this army under the divine conduct and shall therewith conquer Darius and destroy the power of the Persians and that all things will succeed according uh, to what is in my own mind. And when he had said this to Parmenio and had given the high priest his right hand, the priest ran along by him, and he came into the city. <clears throat> Excuse me. And when he went up into the temple, he offered sacrifice to the Heavenly Father, according to the high priest's direction, and magnificently treated both the high priest and the priest. Right? And when the book of Daniel was showed him, wherein Daniel declared, which what we have today, which is Daniel the 8th chapter, right? Right? Wherein, I'm sorry, and when the book of Daniel was showed him, wherein Daniel declared that one of the Greeks should destroy the empire of the Persians, he supposed that himself was the person intended, and as he was then glad, he dismissed the multitude for the present. But the next day he called them to him and bade them ask what favor they pleased of him. So when he heard that, oh, so your people had a prophecy of me taking over the Persians? Damn, I got, I, I, woo, that, that sounded good to him because that was his intention anyway, so, right? Because what? Again, the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord, right? So this was the intention really of the heavenly father to do it. So the heavenly father is the one that put in Alexander's mind to what? To be at ought, to be against the Persians, right? But him seeing that and hearing that is like, oh, so your people had a prophecy or some, uh, 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 something in your scrolls written about me. So he was like, yeah, that's me. Uh, that, that, that I'm going to be the guy that takes down the Persians. So then the next day he comes and he's like, okay, because you guys, you know, the vision I had, you guys were peaceful unto me, treated me well. And, you know, he was probably very impressed with that, uh, that prophecy written about him, right? He was like, you know, what favor shall I, uh, shall I give unto your people, right? So where was I? Uh, one second. All right, let me read that again. It says, but the next day he called uh, them to him and bade them bade them ask what favors they pleased of him, whereupon the high priest desired that they might enjoy the laws of their forefathers. So basically asking, hey, let us keep the customs of our forefathers. Let us, you know, do what we do, right? That, that's the thing that they ask. 
and he might pay no tribute on the seventh year. He granted them all they desired, and when they entreated him that he would permit the Jews in Babylon. So what? There was also Israelites even in Babylon. You had Israelites in the land of Judah, uh, Jerusalem, excuse me, and you had those who were in Babylon as well, showing you that our people, according to the curse, were scattered throughout the four corners of the earth. <laughs> right? Uh, and when they entreated him that he would permit the Jews or the Israelites in Babylon and Midia, see, oh, I forgot about that, to enjoy their own laws also, he willingly promised to do hereafter what they desired. And when he said to the multitude that if any of them would enlist themselves in his army on this condition, that they should continue under the law, law of their forefathers. So, hey, if any of the people want to fight on my side, they could also they have free reign to keep their laws as well. So you ain't got to worry about eating no pork or anything. Nah, you keep the laws of your forefathers if any of your men want to join my army as well. So he was giving, he was rolling out the red coffee. And he was like, listen, I was very impressed with them. Whatever y'all want, y'all good. Uh, uh, that they should continue under the laws of, uh, law of their forefathers and live according to them. He was willing to take them with him. Many were ready to accompany him in his wars. So when Alexander had thus settled the matter at Jerusalem, so he's leaving, he led his army into the neighboring cities, and when all the inhabitants to whom he came received him with great kindness, the Samaritans, right, which that goes back to, if I'm not mistaken, uh, is that 1 Kings or 2 Kings? No, I believe that's 2 Kings. I don't know why I always do that. I just want to find, uh, where was it? Here we go. All right. So let me read that again, and then we'll get back to this. So it says here, So when Alexander had thus settled the matters at Jerusalem, he led his army into neighboring cities, and when all the inhabitants to whom he came received him with great kindness, the Samaritans, who had then, then Shechem for their metropolis, a city uh, uh, situate at Mount Gerizim and inhabited, inhabited by apostates of the Jewish nation or Israelite nation, seeing that Alexander had so greatly honored, it says Jews, but again, Israelites, determined to profess themselves Jews or Israelites. So they saw, oh, snap, Alexander was uh, did, uh, did the Israelites a great service. He was, you know, nice to them. He was kind to them. So it's like, yo, let's 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 go over there and profess ourselves to also be Israelites. Just like the elder apostle was saying in his lesson. When he go to, let's go to like he was going into, in Esther 8 and 17, and in every province and in every city whatsoever the king's commandment com, I'm sorry, whatsoever the king's commandment as decree came, the Jews had joy and gladness, a, a feast and a good day. And many of the people of the land, which are the other nations, became Jews. Like he was saying, not because they want to keep the customs or they like the Israelites. No, but because of the fear of the king's command that, hey, if you touch any of these people, you're gonna, your house and your children and everything is going to be made a dunghill, meaning that you're going to be put to death and everything that you have and own is going to be destroyed. And nobody wants that. So they pretended or had an allegiance with the Israelites only because of fear of the king's commandment. Because you got to remember, before the king's commandment, before everything was revealed, what Haman was trying to do and what Esther uh, told the king, these people were ready to roll on the Israelites and kill them because of the original decree, which uh, Haman, uh, Haman, the son of Hamadatha, pretty much, you know, uh, saying we got put the battery in, a, a, um, in the king's back to do that. Right. He pretty much gave the account when you go into the editions of Esther and the Apocrypha, like, yo, you got an unruly people in your nation and things like that. You should take them out. And, you know, I'll make sure that that's taken care of for you. So the king gave that. OK, you know what? You, you do that, Haman. Right. But then when it was found out, you know, Esther revealed who uh, uh, who she was, that she was Islam and things like that. And then things started ha happening for uh, for Haman. That wasn't so good because Haman uh, eventually, you know, was uh, trying to, you know, plead to Esther, like, yo, you know, whatever he was saying, like, yo, trying to plead to Esther, like, yo, calm the king down, talk to him. But the way it looked when he was trying to plead to her, you read in the scriptures, like, yo, is he trying to force himself on my woman? 
because the king was very favorable. I'm sorry, Esther was very favorable in the uh, in Xerxes' eyes, right? He loved her greatly. So when you know, when Haman was trying to you know get Esther, uh, uh, Esther to appeal for him, it looked like yo he was trying to force himself on Esther. So then the king was like, oh hell no, he's trying to force himself on my woman as well. Send him to the gallows, right? So because of that, and then when the king made a new decree to, hey, don't touch the Israelites, that's why they, they was like, oh, yeah, you know, we, we, we cool with the Israelites. We, we, we Jews too, we Israelites too, because of the fear of the commandment of the king, not because they liked them. Remember, at one point, because of the first decree of the king, they were ready to kill these people. So now going back to the Samaritans, this is dealing with... Uh, uh, Second Kings, the seventeenth chapter. I'm not going to read all of this, but I'm going to go ahead st at least start off here at verse twenty-four. But just to give you a summary of the uh, yeah, my ear is tickling me of uh, what were the previous verses. Pretty much, you had as we see here, Hosea reigning, who was who was the king of the northern kingdom. He eventually, you know, found uh, pretty much conspiracy was found out. Uh, a uh, conspiracy was found out about him because of Shalmaneser the fifth, if I'm not mistaken. So Shalmaneser the fifth took him out, and then eventually Shalmaneser. Now, according to historians, historians, whether this be true or not, they say that yeah, Shalmaneser the fifth may have started, but it was it was uh, also uh, Sargon the second that continued the uh, deportation of the northern kingdom, right, the northern kingdom into the land of Assyria and things like that, right. But whether that be true or not, whether it was Shalmaneser that did do it or after Shalmaneser V, Sargon II, still the northern kingdom was taken out, right, of the, uh, of the land of Samaria. And then when we get to verse 24, see the cities of, cities of Israel, which is in uh, Samaria, filled with strangers, which that's what we're reading here when I go back to the book of Josephus. But I just wanted to get the history, right, the account of that happening. It says, and the king of Assyria, whether that be Shalmaneser V or Sargon II still, and the king of Assyria brought men from Babylon and from Cutha, from Ava, from Hamath, and from Sep, Sef, I'm sorry, Sep Varahim, Var if I'm saying that word incorrectly, and placed them in the cities of Samaria instead of the children of Israel. So he deported the northern kingdom out of the land of Samaria and put heathens in the land, and they possessed possessed Samaria and dwelt uh, and dwelt in the cities thereof, right? And then eventually it goes into how when they were living there, they were serving their gods, and then the Heavenly Father sent lions among them, and then eventually it was besought for a priest, which is a Levite, to come over there and, you know, teach them how to live in the land. And so eventually, you know, they were chilling there or whatever, right? Or at least the Lord stayed the lions off. Whatever they did was at least okay enough for the Lord to be like, okay, I'm not going to keep destroying y'all like that because it still says that they were, you know, still serving their gods, but whatever they were doing was like, okay, it's enough for me not to keep the lines on y'all anymore. So you have heathens living in the land of Samaria, right? So now let's go back because uh, that was a lot of words that came out of me. Let's go back to what we were reading here, <coughs> excuse me, in the book of Josephus, Right? So it says the Samaritans who had then Shechem for their metropolis, a city si uh, situate at Mount Gerizim, right? This is in the land of Samaria and inhabited by apostates of the Jewish nation, seeing that Alexander had so greatly honored the Jews, which are Israelites, determined to profess themselves Jews or Israelites. For such is the disposition of the Samaritans. As we have already elsewhere declared, so that was a point made in the book of Josephus, that this same point that he's going to make, this is not something new that they do. They always pretend to be us, to be friends with us, right? Uh, that when the Jews, right, or again, you could, let me just sub that word Jews out with Israelites, that when the Israelites are in adversity, they deny that they are of kin to them, and then they confess the truth. What's the truth? Here in Kings that, hey, this is the history, that we are the descendants of those long ago that were put here by uh, by the king of Assyria. 
So anytime the Israelites are in trouble, they tell the truth that, hey, we're not Israelites neither, right? We were just put in this land over here by the king of Assyria, and we are those descendants, right? But when they perceived that some good fortune, like what Alexander had done to the Israelites that we read about, had befallen them, they immediately pretend to have communion with them, saying they belong to them and derive their genealogy from the posterity of Joseph, Ephraim and Manasseh. See? So just like the elder apostle was saying here with Acts, I'm sorry, not Acts, Esther 8 and 17, that this is what these other nations would do. Specifically, those that were in the land of Samaria, they would pretend to be us anytime things were good, so that way they could receive of those benefits. But anytime adversity happened, something bad happened, another nation came against us. Whoa, 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 we're not them. We're just living in this land. They didn't want to befall that. See, when it's all good, when, you know, when everything is good, they want to get a slice of the cake. But when things is bad, they're like, nah, we're not those people. They profess the truth like this thing, uh, uh, like the book said. Right? So I just wanted to bring out that, uh, that point, you know, and back up the elder apostle of that. Right? And also, let me just get uh, in here. Also, I want to read this part here, Romans 9, right? Because individuals like vocab and those are always trying to make it seem like, you know, this is about everybody. No, this is not about everybody. This is only about the Israelites, right? Now, I have here Romans 9. Uh, we're going to read from the first verse to the fifth verse, but I'm not going to read it in the KJV. I'm actually going to read it in this Bible that I have here. It's called the New Oxford Annotated Bible with the Apocrypha Expanded Version. It has a red cover on it. I found out about this Bible from the Elder Malcolm of the uh, of GMS Chicago, if I'm not mistaken. So I'm going to read to you Romans chapter 9 in uh, this version here. So this is Paul, Paul speaking as well. It says, I am speaking the truth in Hamashiach. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and, a, and an, I'm sorry, unceasing anguish in my heart. For I, I'm sorry, for I could wish that myself were accursed and cut off from Hamashiach for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen by race. See, by race. So he's letting you know there that I wish I could have been the one. Right. That I wish I was a curse of my people, my kinsmen, my brethren by race. What race or what nationality was the Apostle Paul? Doesn't he tell you that? What I also are, matter of fact, let's get that. Uh, are they not Hebrews? Uh, the tribe of Benjamin, let me put that. Right. And even as you can see, here, Romans 11 and one. Right. It says what Israel not cast away. I say, then, had God cast away his people, God forbid, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. So Apostle Paul gives you what he is. He is also of the seed of Abraham. He is from the tribe of Benjamin. So when he is going back to Romans nine. He's letting you know who the Lord went on the cross for. The Lord went on the cross for what? His brethren. Oh, let me find that part again. His brethren, my kinsmen, by race. Right? Let's get the race definition. Oh, I have it right here. Right? And even if you just go to what? The word race has multiple origins and meanings. French. The word race was introduced into English into English in the 16th century from old French word uh, raza, which means kind, breed, lineage, right? Even when you go to the Latin, right? It says the Latin word genius or genus is similar to the concept of race and means a group sharing qualities related to birth, descent, origin, race, stock, or family. Apostle Paul is of the stock of Israel. Because his lineage goes back to Abraham. Like he said, I am of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. 
It's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob's name got changed to Israel, the father of the, the patriarch of the 12 tribes of Israel, and Benjamin was one of those tribes. See, the Greek also. The Greek word genos means race or kind. Gonos, if I'm saying that correctly, has meaning related to birth, offspring, stock. So the race, right, that Paul was, you know, pretty much troubled in mind for was the Israelites. So when you go to, in the scriptures in the, in the New Testament, about bringing Jew and Gentile back together, it's talking about those Israelites and the Israelites that fell away from their customs. And you have to know the history of how those Israelites or who are being called Gentiles in the scriptures, which are Israelites, fell away from their customs. And that's where the book of Maccabees comes into. And throughout history, because those, uh, when you go to the book of Maccabees, some of the Israelites took heed to Antiochus Epiphany's decree that what? All should be one people and all should be what? Hellenized, followed the ways of the Greeks. So the, some of our people, right, some kept the ways and some didn't. Right. That's where you get into more of the, the story of Maccabees with Judas and his brethren fighting to keep the ways. So that's why when you read, when you get to the New Testament, you have such a animosity and such a, a thing where you have those of the circumcision, those who kept the laws and those of the uncircumcision, which are being called Gentiles, not actual Gentiles, not heathens, but Israelites. Right. Who are being likened unto heathen because they're not keeping their customs. They are not circumcised in mind. That's why they were saying you have to be circumcised after the ways of Moses. Because how would they, those who are of the circumcision, circumcised in mind? After the ways of Moses, because their forefathers were given the law back on Mount Sinai. This is all about Israel. It's not about everybody. And there's numerous scriptures that go into that, go into the restoration of Israel, that although the Heavenly Father had brought upon all this pain upon Israel, that what? At the end, I'm going to restore you and restore you better than at your beginning. It never talks about everybody being restored. This is why, like, uh, Elder Apostle Gabar did a very beautiful lesson on going into the middle wall of partition. There was a separation between the nation of Israel. That's why you have what? The northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, because under David and before King Solomon had gone off, it was one nation. And that nation was rent in two because Solomon went off. And that's why you have the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And it's about bringing Ezekiel, the 37 chapter, take the stick of Ephraim, his companions, take the stick of Judah and his companions and make it one in thine hand. B break amending the rift between the nation of, uh, between the northern and the southern kingdom and bringing them back together so to bring this all together those gentiles saying that in quotation those gentiles are not actual heathen nations those are israelites that fell away from their customs and the lord is calling them back to them why because you are israelites you are of the stock of abraham and these promises and everything uh, let me continue reading, right? For I, I'm sorry, for I could wish that myself were accursed and cut off from Hamashiach for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen by race. They are Israelites, and to them belong the sonship, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, right? Let me just pull that up here as well so you can see it as well, right? To them belong the patriarchs, and of their race, according to the flesh, is the anointed uh, uh, God who is over all uh, be blessed forever. So to them, let's read it in the KJV, right? Who are Israelites? To whom pertaineth the adoption, the glory, the covenants, and the giving of the law? The giving of the law was to Israel not the whole world, right? And the service of God. What is the service of God? The serving of the Heavenly Father by what? Keeping his ways. And the promises, the promises made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And when you read the promises made by the, uh, made by the Heavenly Father, uh, by the certain, when he spoke through his certain prophets, Isaiah 60, 61, 62, those are promises made to Israel, spoken by the prophet Isaiah. Ezekiel, 
Jeremiah, all these things that, yes, Israel had gone through this, you know, like Dan, uh, Daniel said in Daniel, the ninth chapter, what, that no, uh, all these things haven't uh, happened like unto Israel. Let me bring that out real quick. Oops, I think I passed it. All right, here we go. Daniel 9 and 9, to the Lord our God belong mercies and forgiveness. Though we have rebelled against him, neither have we obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. Yea, all Israel have transgressed thy law, even by departing. That's why the Lord bring the curses upon them because of our disobedience. And what? He separated our nation. Yea, all Israel have transgressed, right, even by departing that they may not, I'm sorry, that they might not obey thy voice. Therefore, the curse is poured upon us. And the oath that is written on the law of Moses, which is Deuteronomy, the 28th chapter, uh, um, I'm sorry, and the oath that is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, because we have sinned against him. Excuse me. And he had confirmed his words, which he spake against us and against our judges that judge us by bringing upon us a great evil. For under the whole heaven had not been done as had been done upon Jerusalem, because the promises or the agreement was what? You keep my laws, you're going to be blessed. You're going to be good. If you disobey from verses 15 to 68, this is what will happen to you. And this is what happened to the Israelites throughout their various captivities. But there was also promises made via the prophets, specific other prophets as well, but specifically just using the, the, the ones with the three biggest books, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel, that yes, although Israel was this rebellious woman, although Israel did these things, I am going to bring them back to the land because of the promises I made to their forefathers, and I'm going to treat them better than at their beginning. This is the same rhetoric over and over that, look, you're going to go through this hell because of your disobedience to me. But at the end, I'm going to do justice. I'm going to do right by you and make sure that you're all good. I'm going to forgive your sins written of in Micah. Let's get that. I didn't really want to go this deep, but spirit just has me uh, continuing. Uh, where is it? I know it's in Micah 7. Right, here we go. This is, oh, damn it. Micah 7 and 18, who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He retaineth not his anger forever because he delighteth in mercy. He will turn again. He will have compassion upon us, not the whole world. This was never about everybody. It was only about the nation of Israel and the heavenly father. He will have compassion on us, not the world. He will subdue our iniquities, our sins that we have committed to him. And thou will cast all their sins, our sins, into the depths of the sea. Thou will perform the truth to Jacob and the mercy to Abraham, which thou hast sworn unto our fathers from the days of old. The Heavenly Father never made a promise with the whole world. I mean, the only promise was, you know, not to flood the earth again. Right. But other than that, the promise was never to the whole world that everybody would be blessed and everybody would partake in the promises and blessings of the Heavenly Father. No, it was to Abraham and his seed. And I went from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob and that fell upon the 12 patriarchs, which then out of them came the whole the 12 tribes of Israel. And because of that promise and agreement that he made with them, any time they went off. They would be cursed from verses six. I'm sorry, from verses 15 to 68. They partake of that. But anytime they were good, yeah, they would get the blessings from verses 1 to 14. But when they went off, verses 15 to 68. But through the mouth of the prophets, that hey, although Israel was a rebellious woman, like we're reading here in Micah, what? The Lord will what? Turn again back unto them and forgive and have compassion on us and will subdue our iniquities, not the iniquities of the world, the iniquities of the Israelites. Last one. Uh, where is that? No, it's Amos 3. Hear the word that the Lord, Yahweh, had spoken against you, O children of Israel, 
against the whole family which I brought up from the land of Egypt, saying, You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. So the same way he punished us for all of our iniquities, right, because of the iniquities we commit to him, he's also going to restore and bless us as well, according to his great mercy, according to the promises that he made to our forefathers, not everybody. So stop trying to, which we know that you're not going to stop. But it's just stop trying to make this about everybody. It's not. When you read the scriptures, the scriptures do not talk about everybody partaking in the blessings and the covenant. Like Paul said, to whom pertain the adoption, the covenant, the givings of the law, that pertain to Israel. And that's only ever going to pertain to Israel. So the Gentiles that's written about in the New Testament obviously have to be talking about Israelites. They just fell away, and it's important to know that history. But individuals like Volcan Malone and other individuals who go to church and things like that, who are of the Christian community, don't go into the history. They just bring out John 3.16 and says, For God so loved the world, but don't go into certain words. <laughs> we have learned, beginning with the apostles and the elders of Great Millstone, to go into the understanding, the definition of words. When you go into the word race, what does it mean? It goes back to one French word, which is raza. Another one is genos or genus, which goes into race, stock, family. What did Apostle Paul say? I am of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. So the Lord only went on the cross for his people. It's not for everybody. But I apologize for the ranting, but this is not for everybody. And it's going to be made abundantly clear very soon. And individuals like vocab are going to have that stupid written on their forehead very soon. They think that they're very wise right now and he has his platform and things like that. That man annoys me to no fucking end. I'm just admitting that. That man annoys me to no end. But individuals like Vocab who think that they're so wise and they know the scriptures are going to be made into a big fool, a big dunce he had very soon. So you just wait and see. Keep doing your little things with your videos and keep thinking that you're coming against us. You're just making yourself out to be nothing but a big fool. And yeah, you may have some of our people or a lot of our people that believe your BS, your word salad, but the elect are not going to be fooled by your nonsense. So I want to give all praise, honor, and glory unto Yahweh, Bahasham, Yahweh Shai, Bahasham, Racha, Kodash. Double honors to the apostles, elders of Great Millstone. Peace and blessings to the hopeful elect. Shalom.